This video was brought to you by Ground News. As we covered in another video, rail transport in the UK is in a bit of a mess at the moment. The whole franchising system just didn't really work out as was intended, with rail journeys costing more than they would have done when it was introduced. So it must be good news that the UK government has a project underway to try and upgrade and improve the British rail network. Modern, fast trains with new stations and infrastructure is surely a no-brainer and something that few people will complain about, right? Well, provided that it doesn't cost too much and the project is well managed, then yes, probably. But this project we're going to talk about today hasn't been well run. It's seriously over budget, and just in the last week there have been rumours that some major planned parts of the project are being cut in order to save costs. So in this video, we're going to take a look into HS2. We're going to start by explaining what the project is, then explain why it's got so expensive, and then take a look at what could happen with the project in the near future. To begin explaining what HS2 is, we ought to explain what HS1 is first. HS1 is the UK's first high-speed rail route, connecting London to the port of Dover, and ultimately connecting onto the French high-speed rail network, and resulting in a fully high-speed rail journey for passengers on the Eurostar. Around the world, though, it's not uncommon for countries to have high-speed trains connecting many major cities, allowing passengers to quickly cross the country without the need for flights. Here in the UK, though, HS1 remains the only fully functional high-speed rail connection in the country. So, in 2010, the Labour government proposed a new Y-shaped HS2 route, which would connect Leeds and Manchester to London. This was then endorsed by the Conservative Lib Dem coalition that came into power later the same year. With political approval, all was on track for this new rail route, which would see trains running at about 400 kilometers per hour, or about 250 miles per hour. And as well as just going fast, would also take pressure off commuter trains, as currently both commuter and express trains run on the same lines. Therefore, having a dedicated North-South Express train line would take pressure off these older lines and allow for not just more express trains, but also more commuter trains too. In fact, it's easy to caricature HS2 as a project that allows wealthy businessmen to shuttle between cities more quickly, but this is a real benefit of the project too. It also improves more traditional commuter rail connections as well. Of course, though, it will also cut journey times for those willing to pay. Once it's fully up and running, HS2 will allow people to travel from Birmingham to London in just 52 minutes, down from the current 1 hour 22, and get all the way up to Manchester from London in just an hour and 11 minutes, all the way down from the current fastest time of 1 hour 54 minutes. The point is then that the reasoning behind creating a new high-speed rail network is solid. Its execution, though, leaves a lot to be desired. That's because the project has been beset by a variety of problems that have, from the very start, driven up the cost. So in this second part of the video, let's explain why HS2 has become so expensive. When the project was first announced back in 2010, the first leg of the journey from London to Birmingham had an estimated cost of about £16 billion, which, when accounting for inflation, is about £22 billion today. However, just so far, this leg has ended up costing £50 billion, more than double what was expected, and shockingly, the same price as the total budget for the entire project back in 2015. Now, though, the whole project is expected to cost more than £100 billion. When we compare this to other high-speed rail projects across Europe, we can see that the UK is expected to spend far more money per mile on HS2 than other comparable schemes. According to the Times, just phase one of HS2, which connects London to Birmingham, is expected to cost about £319 million per mile. And as you can see, that's a lot more than the high-speed connection between Stuttgart and Munich that cost Germany just £70 million per mile, a price which was already at the higher end of costs for European high-speed rail networks. It is worth saying, though, that these comparisons may actually be a little unfair, but 
that's something we'll get back to in a moment. Nonetheless, with the cost so much higher than expected, we thought it might be worth talking to an expert on this matter to find out exactly why this is. So we sat down with Gareth Dennis, a rail engineer, writer, and expert on this topic. We asked him what he thought the three main reasons were for the project costing so much thus far. But the, so there's three things are big projects, instead of delivering a strategic program, a lack of investment and a lack of commitment from central government, and a high level of fragmentation in the industry. Those three things combine to, to, to make those costs really quite a lot higher than they should be. So let's examine this in a little more detail. Speaking specifically about the fact that HS2 has been done all as one project, Gareth explained this. That in the UK, we have an obsession, a fixation with big projects and not delivering strategic programs. So, so most other high-speed rail projects in Europe, you don't deliver the whole thing from big station to big station as one project. There will be a big station remodeling project. That'll be its own thing. You'll then build a bit of high speed line, and that's the thing that people are comparing to HS2, which is just the fairly simple, frankly, you know, bit of high speed line running through the countryside. So that ignores going through complex city approaches, which in Europe either don't exist because they run it on the existing network, or it's its own project. It's kind of bunched in as a different project. A way to get around that is rather than going, we're delivering this whole big project, and it's called HS2, you'd go, well, we're delivering this section, which is from the southern end of the West Midlands through to the, the northern end of London. That's its own contract. That's being delivered as a, as a thing. We're delivering Euston Station Upgrade as one project and all of these pit, bits and pieces all stitched together. And as a result of that, by not delivering a program of work, by delivering it as one big hit, you end up with a very high unit rate, you know, a high cost per mile. So that's number one. Moving on to his second reason, Gareth explained more about why he thought the government's lack of commitment to the project was one of the reasons it's ended up costing so much. Generally in the UK, we just have a low level of commitment to big infrastructure anyway. Don't spend enough on big strategic transport projects. Crossrail is the only other one that's going on before that, a high-speed one. We just don't deliver this work at enough scale. We do a big hit project and then we do nothing for a decade. You know, We don't deliver enough of this type of work and, and we should be delivering more of it. And as a result of that, the supply chain is not the right shape, not the right size. And that lack of government commitment means that prices will be higher. And that accounts for a substantial amount of the extra cost. And finally, Gareth explains more about the fragment fragmentation in the construction industry. His third reason as to why HS2 has cost more than expected. Rather than relying on a series of large contractors um, who kind of do a lot of the work in-house, we have a huge number of SMEs, of, of small and medium enterprises that deliver little, little bits and pieces of the work, which means that we have to employ lots of lawyers to manage those contracts. It's difficult to get the right skills in the right place. As a result of that huge fragmentation, again, that adds as much as 20% extra onto construction project costs. Now, these three setbacks haven't done wonders for the project, and it's fair to say that there's some public pushback in regards to the spiralling costs and delayed delivery time. However, as we saw with Crossrail in London, it's not particularly uncommon to see projects like this go over budget and get delayed. So we asked Gareth whether, with all of this in mind, he still thinks the project is worth both the weight and the cash. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, ultimately, the cost of all of those other upgrades is also only increasing. So even the alternatives, which, by the way, would deliver a, only a tiny fraction of the benefit that HS2 would, all of those are getting much more expensive anyway. And they were, to be honest, more expensive than HS2 to start with. The reality is the most efficient and effective way to deliver a massive upgrade of, of our rail network and a massive increase in capacity of our existing rail network is to build these new high-speed lines to, to, to segregate that traffic. There's, there's, there is no more effective, cost-effective or time-effective way to achieve that. So while Gareth still thinks the project is worth it, there's clearly a wide array of opinions on this topic, and a lot of Brits still don't want to see this go ahead. There's strong opinions on both sides of this debate, but one way you can cut through bias like this is by using Ground News. Ground News was created to give you access to as many diverse perspectives as possible. That makes Ground News a website and app which can help you actively burst your media bubble. It lets you compare how breaking news stories are being covered across the political spectrum. For every news story, you can see the number of sources reporting, as well as the political bias of those sources. And that's important, because the same story can take on a totally different meaning, depending on how it's being framed. And this becomes really clear when you use their blind spot feature, a news feed dedicated to the stories that are disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum. Here you might discover information that challenges your perspective, 
or simply helps you understand someone else's media reality. You can even keep track of your personal daily reading habits with a personalized dashboard that shows you tons of stats about where the news you're reading is really coming from. And that makes it a really fascinating way to read the news, and quite unlike any other news app out there. And to give it a try, you should head over to ground.news forward slash TLDR. There you can subscribe to get unlimited access to all of their features and support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.